All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, good day, good evening, wherever you are. It is my pleasure to introduce Petter Thompson, who's uh, currently at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and he's going to tell us about using acyclic complexes to extend work of bookvites into a non-affine setting. Petter. Well, thank you, first of all, to Sean and Eloisa. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk in a setting like this in a time when we don't uh, get to go around and see all of our friends. So this is great. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will be talking about, um, I do want to reiterate, if anybody has questions or comments along the way, please feel free to pause and, or interrupt me. Um, uh, just uh, do unmute and let me know. Otherwise, we can talk about it at the end, too. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, totally acyclic complexes, but I want to talk about a specific um, application um, towards work of buchweiz, which I will uh, get into, and uh, uh, extending this into a non-affine setting. And uh, we don't have to get too scared by the non-affineness here. It's, I mean, I'm going to talk about things that are largely affine, but um, in the end, things work out nicely for schemes too. So uh, depending on where your comfort, all will be well, I hope. Um, so I'm going to just first put some of the references up because I'm not going to write all of these names repeatedly. So here are a few, can, yeah, everybody can see my screen, I think. A um, few of the, uh, I, oh, I haven't actually written the titles, but you can just puzzle over what they might be called, I guess, as we go. Um, the first two, I mean, pretty much everything I talk about today is very much joint with uh, Lars Christensen uh, at Texas Tech University and Sergio Estrada at the University of Murcia in Spain. And um, so the first two papers are with them and well, all four of them are with them. Um, and the last two are also with uh, a number of other authors. So um, for the full references, you can also take a look at uh, my website or uh, something like this. Um, and I will just try to indicate some of the authors as we go here. Okay, so uh, very briefly, here's an outline. Um, I will actually start writing in a second and then, and then things will get slow. Um, but uh, I wanna talk about very briefly, totally acyclic complexes of projectives. Um, and uh, 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 and uh, kind of motivate why total why we talk about totally acyclic complexes, where this comes up. And this really ties into um, what uh, Buchweitz was thinking about and many, many others uh, since him as well, um, in, in terms of what, I mean, what the relationship uh, to Gorenstein rings, to Max McCollum calling modules, to homotopy categories, singularity categories, derived categories, all sorts of uh, kind of fun objects and, and things come into play. Um, and we can relate to totally acyclic complexes. Um, and uh, then uh, I will, will kind of zoom out um, and talk about a very general uh, framework for total acyclicity and Gorenstein objects that, I mean, really works in any abelian category or, 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 or worse, I guess. I mean, you can, this, this is completely structural. Um, and I will focus a little bit on the flat case and, uh, um, I mean, all of this is motivated somehow. The main application is this um, application to a non-affine. So uh, I will kind of return to that at the end. Okay, so please stop me uh, as we go. If you have questions, um, I guess my setting is a ring uh, and we won't even need that some of the time, but uh, I put it there. So if I forget, R is a ring and it is uh, a reasonable ring, so it should be associative and have an identity, as as Roger would probably insist. Um, so let me uh, let me start with uh, just talking a little bit about totally totally acyclic. Okay, so here's where using the old iPad will will probably about kill me, but we're gonna try. Um, okay, so I am never going to write the word totally acyclic. Instead, I will probably write totally acyclic complex like that. Um, and I uh, want to focus first a little bit on totally acyclic complexes of projectives. And this I will just briefly talk about um, uh, because these are the kind of things that uh, Rebecca was talking about last week, if you were in the seminar last week. Um, and so, but, I, but let me at least define it because this is sort of crucial to everything we, we talk about here. So a totally acyclic complex, I'm going to add of projectives because uh, we will talk about these things more generally um, later, uh, is an acyclic complex, is an acyclic 
Maybe I can zoom this a little bit. Ah, there we go. An acyclic uh, complex T um, with a TI projective. So each component is projective and the duals uh, and HOM of my acyclic complex into any projective is also acyclic. Uh, for any projective uh, module P. Okay, so I write this too because I want to point out that I'm not going to make any assumptions about finitely generated. Um, uh, so uh, I, if, if I want things to be finitely generated, I will say so as we go. All right, um, so these are just, um, oh, well, here, let me put a little bit more too. I, these are uh, one more definition. So a Gorenstein projective Gorenstein projective, uh, or I will sometimes write just GP um, module is a syzygy or a cycle module or a kernel in such an acyclic complex. So is, mm, is a module isomorphic to some uh, kernel or cycle or something in such a T where T is a totally acyclic complex of projectives. Okay, and uh, maybe these are familiar to you or maybe not, but uh, in any case, let me just um, give you an example. I mean, this is kind of the most baby example we can come up with for these kind of objects, just to keep in mind as you're, we're working with these categories, so you have something kind of concrete to, to think about. Um, so, I mean, for instance, look at, um, maybe take K to be a field and look at a polynomial ring and a couple of variables and kill off their product. Um, I'm sure uh, then we can just take uh, the, the complex with the ring in every degree. Um, and uh, in every degree, we just multiply by alternating X, Y, X, Y, and so forth. And you can just directly check that this is of course exact in every degree. And um, if you hom it into a project projective, you get something that looks just the same and it's also exact in every degree. And so this is a totally acyclic complex. And so of course you can, you know, look at the little cycle modules here, something like, you know, R mod Y or something. And here we get a nice little, a, a little tiny baby Gorenstein projective module and so forth. And so if, if, if things start to get, you know, uh, very abstract, just pretty much everything can, I mean, this is an example of pretty much everything. So we can always come back to this example. Okay. So, uh, and these, this is exactly the kind of things, uh, this complex here is what uh, the kind of things that uh, Rebecca was considering. Um, sort of the most simple case, because there's, there's no growth in any direction, right? Is she here? Yeah, she's here too. Okay, good. So I better not say any false things about what she said, but um, it certainly is, it's pretty, pretty small. All right. Um, so just for some names of categories as I go here. So GP uh, will be my category of uh, finitely generated uh, Gorenstein projectives uh, with the lowercase. And uh, I, I mean, this is a nice uh, category. Um, so this is what's known as a Frobenius category um, in the sense that uh, the projective and injective objects coincide and there's enough of them. And so there's actually a nice um, associated stable category. And so you can kind of get this nice, uh, there exists a stable, uh, stable category, which maybe we'll call something like STGP of R. Okay. And uh, this <laughs> kind of very roughly speaking is where you take the Gorenstein projective R modules and then you kill off the projectives. Um, I mean, one ought to be a little bit more careful. Um, you should be modifying HOM sets and such, but uh, that's roughly what it looks like. All right. Um, okay, so these are, these are the basic objects uh, that we can think about. Um, but uh, let me talk a little bit about kind of why uh, totally acyclics. And to, so to answer that question, I want to um, just kind of overview what Buchweiz proved and the categories uh, he was thinking about. So um, I want to focus, at least for this part of my talk, I'm going to focus on R being a Gorenstein ring. Um, Gorenstein. Um, I mean, I guess even Gorenstein local, if you want to, this is not all strictly necessary, but just 
for things to be nice for a little bit. Um, Buchweiz showed the following. And I guess I'm thinking of the 86, uh, the 1986 manuscript. Um, and uh, that this category that I've just mentioned, this stable category of Gorenstein projectives, oops, there we go, Gorenstein projective R modules, is actually equivalent to all of these totally acyclic things. So I'll denote this by K tech. I think this is what Rebecca called K tech of R. I'm going to put a proj just because sometimes I'm maybe considering some extra modules in there. Um, and this is also in turn equivalent to uh, what's been known now as the singularity category of the ring. Um, and I guess almost none of this notation or terminology is really actually what Buchweiz was talking about, but in this is this is the terminology I'm going to use at least for this talk. Okay, so for, what do I mean by that? I mean, for for example, the stable Gorenstein uh, projectives. Uh, this, I mean, when R is a Gorenstein ring, this is just the stable category. Sometimes it's written like uh, MCM underline. This is the stable category of maximal co macaulay modules. Um, the middle one, of course, is the homotopy category of totally acyclic projectives that I mentioned. And uh, the singularity category, I guess this is just by definition. Um, this is, there's lots of notation one might use, but it's the bounded derived category uh, modded out, I suppose, by uh, the perfect complexes. Okay, um, so those are, so you're essentially looking at the category you have to be a little bit more careful again, but you're taking the Verdier quotient where you're killing off the uh, bounded complexes of projectives, roughly speaking. All right. Um, so <clears throat> these, these equivalences somehow, at least in my mind, have sort of become crucial to the relationship between uh, a lot of these um, objects and categories. Um, why, I mean, the singular, let me just talk a little bit about them. I mean, the singularity category is uh, called that, I mean, uh, for, for a local ring, uh, this vanishes if and only if we're looking at a regular local ring. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, and um, let's see. Yeah, and more is, more is true here, but maybe let me uh, hold off on that a little bit. Um, but I guess, I guess uh, maybe all I wanted to point out here is sort of the, the, the use of these totally acyclic complexes um, can be a useful tool in relating a, a variety of types of um, objects in this area. Um, and I'll also say that, I mean, these, these equivalences are, are nothing abstract. They're actually, uh, most of them you can write down very explicitly uh, what we're looking at. I mean, so for instance, like this, there's actually a, uh, and they're not just some abstract equivalences. They're really, I mean, you take a totally acyclic complex of projectives, just like in the example, you can look at a zero cycle and look, you're looking at a Gorenstein projective. Now you just have to check that, in fact, you've gotten an equivalence. And so you can construct maps the other direction and all sorts of things. Okay, so it's a very nice kind of setup. So um, if, if nothing else, this is, this is the picture I'm going to return to. And if I haven't returned to this by like five minutes before the end, uh, I'm going to jump back to this picture so I can talk about it. But um, one of our goals is to take this picture and say, hey, the same thing works in a non-affine setting. So let me br briefly just say, if, if I'm looking at a, something like a semi-separated Netherian scheme, then all of these categories have very natural analogs and they are equivalent when we might expect them to be equivalent. And this is sort of a project that was started by Murphy and Solari um, maybe around a decade ago. Okay, so I, I will come back to that and that's where we're going with this. All right, so um, let's see where I'm, all my papers are here. Um, <clears throat> maybe I will first start by saying that uh, a bit more is true here. So first of all, in fact, um, this stable category of Gorenstein projectives, uh, if I replace the lower case GP with an uppercase GP, so if I'm not assuming something about finitely generated, and, um, and then I also drop that assumption over here, so I'm looking at big P, so uh, any complexes of totally acyclic complexes of projectives, these are actually still equivalent. Um, and I mean, really, you can do this with the same tools that Buchweiz was doing. I mean, we, we have a proof of this in 
the paper I called CET1, I think. Um, but it, it, I mean, this is actually true, um, oops, for any uh, ring R, for any R. I mean, absolutely no assumptions. Um, so we don't need anything about Gorenstein. So these are somehow fundamentally sort of the same category to look at. Um, on the other hand, uh, let's see, on the other hand, um, uh, that other equivalence, you can look at these equivalents in lots of different ways, but um, <coughs> um, K, K tack of proj, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, equivalent to the singularity category of R, uh, actually, if and only if uh, R is Gorenstein. Uh, well, I, this is probably for, uh, I guess, if R is commutative. R is, uh, R is commutative Netherium. Uh, then these guys are equivalent if and only if R is Gorenstein. And this is due to, um, I guess, a Berg and uh, Jorgensen um, and Opperman, Stefan Opperman. Um, in 2015. Um, and so, of course, I mean, I've just described the reverse implication, but it's the, the forward implication, I'm sure, I mean, this, this implication that they were looking at. Um, uh, that when these are actually equivalent, then by the natural functor, then you're actually looking at a Gorenstein ring. Okay, so um, a lot of these ideas, um, working with totally acyclic complexes, this is just one, one aspect in which uh, Gorenstein rings come up. I mean, very much, I mean, all of this work with totally acyclic complexes is closely linked to the Gorenstein property, okay? I mean, you don't have to be in Gorenstein ring, but it's very closely linked to that property. All right. Um, I mean, this is, maybe I'll just say that this is sort of a version, this last equivalence here is sort of a triangulated version of the classic uh, equivalence of Auslander bridge um, uh, proving that a, a local ring is Gorenstein if and only if every module, finitely generated module has finite G dimension or um, every module has, uh, in a projective resolution, there's a, there's a Gorenstein projective syzygy. Okay. Um, all right. So, so this is the projective case sort of. Um, and I need to move on to, to get to our main goal here. Um, but uh, I, I guess I will just write a little bit of what I had said. Uh, so Murfit and Solarian in, uh, I think it's 2011 maybe, um, uh, propose a non, sorry, non-affine, analog um, for uh, the middle uh, category, KTAC of Projar. Just kind of squeeze that in there, okay? Um, this is what uh, I think, I guess, Murphy probably in his thesis called something like the, like the mock homotopy category, and then it got redubbed as, uh, I think, like the peer-derived category um, to give a uh, sort of a non-affine analog for this the singularity category. So they um, to to get your hands on a, um, a singularity category over a scheme. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into it, but um, this is something that they they looked at. And so uh, I guess I mean just to kind of shove everything under the rug for now. I mean, our main goal, at least for for today's talk, is to uh, give uh, non-affine, I just mean some scheme version uh, analogs of the other two categories. Two categories. Um, and so uh, the singularity category and the stable category a little bit more explicitly. And I mean, and show that they're actually the right things to look at and that they're equivalent when you might expect them to be and so forth. Okay. And this turns out to be non, um, <clears throat> I don't know, but I mean, it's it, certainly non-trivial. I mean, it, you can't just do uh, what you would hope. And I mean, the main obstruction here is, I mean, 
later I will let X be something like a semi-separated Noetherian scheme, you might not have enough projective objects. And so if you start to look at, you know, Gorenstein projectives and totally acyclic complexes of projectives, you perfect complexes, everything needs projectives. And so if you're going to do something, um, you have to find a way to get around fundamentally using projective objects, which just might not exist. And that's kind of the point of all of this. Um, and so the theme of this is that we are going to replace the projective objects. Um, I mean, uh, the theme in Murphy's Slarian was sort of replace the projective objects by flats and do it in a way that works out nicely. I'm going to go a little bit further and say we ought to pr replace the projective objects uh, with flat cotorsion objects or flat cotorsion modules or sheaves. Okay, and these are special things, but they're nice, and I, I like to advocate for them in all all aspects of algebra, I guess, lately. Um, and the, the way we're going to approach this goal is to kind of develop this very general framework, like I mentioned. And along the way, it'll kind of recover all of the usual things, but and introduce some new stuff too. Okay. Um, let me see how I'm doing on time. I think I'm all right. Um, so, all right. Let me let me just mentally go to a new page because this is this is where the general the general setting starts. So a, a general framework. And I mean, so on its own, uh, I mean, this kind of, so I'm going to let, uh, let me say a little bit about what I'm going to do first. Um, a, you can, let's just take it to be any abelian category. Um, I, I warned you that this would just be, you know, more general than a ring, and that's where it is. I mean, you can certainly think uh, we can take uh, the module category of the ring, or later we'll be looking at the, the quasi coherent sheaves on a scheme um, or any abelian category this works for. And I will let you just be some arbitrary, well, not quite arbitrary, at least an additive uh, subcategory of A. And for convenience, really, uh, I mean, I'll just kind of say that we ought to be assuming uh, that we're close under direct sums for a lot of these results, but I mean, this is relatively weak. Um, and just as a reminder for the, the orthogonal classes, I mean, if I take any subcategory, the right orthogonal class, this is just all of the objects um, such that if I look at the x one, I mean, we can define these in a couple different ways, but I'm just looking at x1 uh, of my object into my other object. I get zero uh, for all, let's see, uh, u in fancy u. Okay, sorry, this got a little squeezed in there. And there's also a u left burp. Uh, I'm just going to say similar. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of the proofs, I don't think, today. Um, so these are the orthogonal categories. And so, I mean, just to keep this a little bit precise uh, or back down to earth, I mean, of course, if you take the projective R modules for a ring and you look at their right orthogonal, if you just think about this for a second, um, well, everything's right orthogonal, right? So this is just all of mod R. And this is, of course, you have to be a little bit careful. This is, uh, you know, this right orthogonal is, is relative to some things. We, we ought to be somewhat careful, but uh, this, is, this is okay. And of course, the left orthogonal of mod R is, is uh, the projectives, okay? You can do the same things with injectives and so forth. Um, so let me, the next definition is kind of the main definition that in, is involved in all of the work, following work. Okay, so here comes the main definition. So if you've fallen asleep, now is the time to just perk up and look at this ridiculously abstract definition. So this is the one we give in our paper with Christensen and Mistrada. I think I numbered it number one up above. So T, let's just take T to be any uh, A complex. So I just mean a complex of objects from A. And I will say T is, uh, right u totally acyclic so this is my the, the new term if well i better have i'll just kind of number these t itself better be acyclic all right so that's that's understandable um we better have uh t uh i mean this better have something to do with u so each of the objects in t were in u let's put it like that and um 
uh, I'm, I'm gonna squeeze a three in here and say, uh, um, hum, if I hum my complex T into, it, it ends up being, I want to look at U intersected with the right orthogonal of U. I know this isn't really a complex, but oh well, for every U and U, those things are acyclic. And if you take, for example, U to be the projectives right now, you're just looking at a complex that's uh, both acyclic, complex of objects in projectives, and you can hum into projectives and you stay acyclic. So that would just be the, the usual definition. Um, but we want to do a little bit more and a number of authors have looked at this and there's some version of that. But uh, what distinguishes this definition is that I wanna also assume that the cycle objects in this T are in the right orthogonal. So this is where the right part so these are in right perp of you. So of course that fourth condition is like vacuous in the projective case, you're not saying anything, but it turns out when you leave the projective injective kind of those, those basic cases, uh, this condition at least seems to be very useful to, to keep in mind. Okay, so this is kind of uh, the, new, the new thing to think about. And there's also, uh, I, I won't write it maybe just for time, but there's also a left uh, U totally acyclic. Okay, so so this is the, this is what I will talk about um, with totally acyclicity. Um, oh, I should I mean these all have categories, and we can also talk about the associated Gorenstein objects. So up here, uh, I mean Z zero of such a complex will be what we will call uh, right uh, U. Gorenstein and so forth. I know this looks a little ugly, but, and, uh, and the same here, you can have left U Gorenstein. I'm not gonna write all these, but the cycle objects in these things are some kind of Gorenstein object. Okay, so, I mean, this definition itself is just fun to play around with and you can get a lot of, you can say a lot of things about what kind of objects these are and the categories they make are very nice. But I mean, just keep in mind that I mean, I, I certainly like to play with these things, they're fun, but sort of the point of doing this was motiva motivated by the flat quatorsion theory so that we can um, say something in a non-affine setting where we don't have projectives. So you can't, uh, uh, so yeah, that's sort of where we're going with a lot of this. Um, uh, maybe again for time, let me not write out the examples, but uh, well, I guess I sort of said, I mean, if, if you use the class of projectives, this is the usual, totally acyclic complexes of projectives and Gorenstein projectives um, modules or whatever you'd like. Um, and you also, uh, I mean, this is symmetric enough that you actually also get um, the injective version. And it's not that the left one is projectives and the right is injectives or something. It's actually for the classes of projectives and injectives. I'll just say that they actually coincide and they're actually very nice in that setting because projectives and injective modules are um, self orthogonal categories. So they actually you actually get something very nice in that setting, but I, let me not worry about that too much. Okay, so this was the main definition. I'll just kind of box the whole thing, um, some version of that. And so um, the categories of these uh, that I'm gonna work with a little bit, so the right U totally acyclic complexes, uh, I will use R, I know the notation just gets a bit messy, but this is something like R gore U of A is what we call these. I mean, the category of right U totally acyclic complexes. Uh, sorry, uh, that's not what I where I meant to put that. Let's go back. These things right here, R gore U of A, and the right U totally acyclic complexes is maybe what I'll denote something like K right U tac of A. I know it gets messy, but oh well. So, so these are so this these two categories. Oops, that's not that's not a highlighter. Maybe this one's a highlighter. This category and this category are the two that I want to focus on a little bit. Okay. All right. So um, let let me state a few results just about these categories to start with, and then uh, and then we can say a few more things. Um, so. First of all, I mean, just like, um, uh, oops, that's not gonna work. Oh no, I didn't want to pen, there we go. So just like, um, 
Uh, the category of Gorenstein projective modules is a Frobenius category, so we have a nice associated stable category. Um, it turns out that um, these categories are also, so CET again, um, so Argor, U of A, and there's also an Elgor, I won't state all of these things. This thing is Frobenius. And um, I mean, at first you might think, well, okay, why not? I mean, of course it should be Frobenius. But uh, one of the motivations for the definition to begin with was actually that if you look at, um, there, I mean, I, I've only talked about Gorenstein projectives, but there's also a natural notion of Gorenstein flat modules and Gorenstein flat objects and such in terms of F totally acyclic complexes. Um, but the category of Gorenstein flat modules is not Frobenius. Uh, well, so it, it is only Frobenius in sort of the trivial settings. And uh, that is sort of what causes a lot of problems when you try to, well, it's one of the many aspects that Gorenstein flat modules just kind of cause some, cause some issues. And um, so this sort of corrects for that. I mean, that it is in fact Frobenius. And so it actually has an, an associated stable category. And so I guess this is part one and part two is that it has, so it, since it's Frobenius, it makes sense to talk about the associated stable category of this, this very abstract thing. And it turn and here's the other category I just written down, K right U tack of, now I'm gonna write, this is just messy, but it's it's the category of the objects we've just been thinking about. So don't worry about the notation. It's it's the thing of the things we were just talking about. And turns out these are equivalent for, I mean, in this complete level of generality. I mean, there's, there's this is just a structural result. There's nothing to do with, you know, Gorenstein rings um, for this particular equivalence. Um, and you can, ex I mean, it's, it's even the functor you expect it to be, that you can take the zero cycle module and, and that's, that's the equivalence. So you can just construct the functors explicitly. But even in proving this, um, maybe I won't, I'm not gonna prove anything today probably, but um, I mean, the proof of this is, um, it brings up some interesting tools to kind of work with these objects. And one of the, the tools that this points out is that, um, for instance, uh, let's see, I wrote something down here. So if you have a couple totally acyclic complexes, um, well, uh, to write you totally acyclic complexes, and you have a map between their zero cycle modules, then you can actually lift it to a map of the entire complexes. And this is not a new idea. I mean, um, many have thought about these kind of ideas about lifting things between totally acyclic complexes, but it's sort of the crucial piece in working with these equivalences. Um, yeah, let me not say any more about that for now. Um, so uh, let, let's focus though on I mean, you can keep playing with these general notions, but let's let's focus on the flat case. Um, I don't remember what I called part four of the talk, but maybe something to do with flats. So the flat case. Um, so for, um, let's see, I guess, yeah, let me, uh, in, in, in the interest of time, let me just say a little bit what the history of the flat case sounds like, okay? So um, for a, there, there is, this nice uh, theory of Gorenstein projectives that I've just out, laid out, but there's also a nice Gorenstein flats and you use something called F totally acyclic. And um, so you don't have anything to do with finitely generated. You can just, any acyclic complex of flats um, is F totally acyclic if I tensor with an injective and it remains acyclic. And this uh, provides a notion of Gorenstein flat. So it kind of, which plays the role of the flats if you're gonna kind of find the corresponding Gorenstein projective projective to Gorenstein projective flat to Gorenstein flat, great. And for right coherent rings, the theory is uh, happy. And uh, uh, for example, Henrik Holm showed that um, basically things work out as you expect. Um, that for right coherent rings, um, Gorenstein flat modules have a nice dimension and all is well. Um, but when you go beyond that realm, things fall apart a little bit. Um, and also, uh, work of uh, Gillespie around the same time, maybe 2004 also, sort of pointed out that, well, I don't know if he quite said it like this, but maybe it's not the Gorenstein flats that we have to look at. It's maybe the cotorsion Gorenstein flat modules. And this is a little bit strange, but it, it kind of keeps coming up repeatedly that maybe these are the ones we ought to be focusing on. And so this sort of motivated what, uh, what we looked at um, and, and we just 
specialized, I mean, there's a lot to get to this point, but specialized to the case where you, in a ring at least, is the, the category of flat cotorsion R modules. And uh, I guess very briefly, I'll just say, I mean, a flat cotorsion module is a module that is both flat and uh, right orthogonal to flats. So it's also cotorsion. All right. Um, and um, when you when you kind of run this machine now, in this case, you end up with uh, a new kind of module called the, I'm just going to write it as GFC equals the, uh, what would be denoted as R Gore flat, I guess these should be capitals, there's no, no finitely generated, flat cut uh, of R or something like that. So you get uh, something that I'm going to call a Gorenstein flat cotorsion uh, module. Okay, um, I'm returning to just the case that where R is just any ring. Um, and uh, uh, these things turn out to be kind of nice. Um, and maybe I'll just, I mean, as uh, it, it, well, I mean, it turns out that these are exactly, um, at least if R is a right coherent ring, it turns out that um, these Gorenstein flat cotorsion R modules that I've just defined. So these are cycles in uh, totally acyclic complexes of flat cotorsions, which are completely natural uh, when you start to play around with them. These are exactly the Gorenstein flat modules that are also cotorsion. Okay, so these are kind of the things that Gillespie and others are starting to think, maybe we should look at the intersection of this class. And it turns out, at least for right coherent rings, that's exactly these modules. They look a little bit different. They're defined differently. Um, for, uh, yeah, so that's, that's one thing. And it also turns out that, um, uh, I mean, because of this, you also, well, and, and a little bit more, you get that the Gorenstein flat dimension is actually the same uh, in my right coherent ring setting as the Gorenstein flat cotorsion dimension. Okay, so why would, I mean, so this isn't really something new, you might think, but it turns out that, um, maybe I'll just squeeze one more theorem in down here. This is due to uh, Christensen, Estrada, Leong, uh, uh, let's see, myself and Wu and Yang here, that paper uh, that I mentioned at the start um, that, uh, well, I'm not going to state anything precise because I have one little line here. Um, uh, for any ring uh, R, um, GFC dimension is nice. OK. I, I mean, this is really just a side result. And I don't want to go into it. But it. I mean, the point is that the Gordonstein flat contortion modules sort of behave as nice as you could possibly hope for. And the, so if you want to play with the dimension theory from them, great. It works out nicely. And it is precisely the same as the Gorenstein flat, but it, it works for all rings. OK, so just kind of a side note. Hey, you get, you get a nice dimension theory as well. Um, and uh, at least for like a local ring, I mean, well, yeah, let me, let me just leave it at that. OK, so now in the last 10 minutes or so, I can actually uh, come back and talk about um, uh, the, the, the extension that I was promising to some kind of non-affine setting. Um, so non-affine setting or analog. Okay, so um, uh, let me just kind of draw some pictures here, I guess, of all of these categories that I've just kind of mentioned. So we had the stable category of Gorenstein projective. Um, let me let me first do this for a ring. So R is Gorenstein ring, first of all. This is equivalent to KTAC of the projective R modules. And this is equivalent to the singularity category. So this was this was Buchweiz. And Murfit and Solarian in 2011 introduced what they called the pure derived category. Maybe it's denoted like DF TAC of flats. I mean, it very much heavily is using the notion of flats as sort of the correct analog. And I won't say more about it than it, it really is the right thing to look at, though. Um, but it, it actually turns out that um, 
that this sort of ab this more derived category, you can actually realize it as a uh, an actual homotopy category also. And it's the category we've been playing around with. It's these totally acyclic complexes of flat quatorsions. Um, so it, it's it's actually, I mean, this, I, I don't know if it's, I, others I think have maybe recognized this, but certainly Lars and Sergio and myself uh, have a proof of this in our, one of our papers. Um, but, it, but you can realize it as an actual homotopy category. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, but what about the other guys? So what about this and what about this? Okay, so let me fill in those two question marks. And um, at least in terms of the references I gave at the start, um, uh, the second paper with uh, Lars and Sergio uh, gives an analog of this, this first one and this paper, C, D, E, H, L, T. There we go, got all the authors in there. <laughs> gives an analog of the second one. All right, and, uh, and then we should say something about these being equivalent to, uh, you know, in some kind of Gorenstein uh, situation. Okay, so the setting, I want to just take X to be a semi-separated uh, Netherian scheme. This is the setting that uh, Murphy and Slarian was working in, so we're going to continue working in there. Um, so the semi-separated is telling you that uh, if I'm looking at an open covering, I'm, my intersection of affine uh, pieces is still affine, and the Netherian is giving me a finiteness condition on, on uh, the existence of an, a finite open uh, affine covering um, with Netherian. Uh, uh, that, that the OX of the UIs in my open covering are, are uh, Netherian. And uh, I'll let Q co of X be the category of quasi-coherent sheaves. Um, on X. Okay, so um, the, the first thing uh, that you can say about uh, this setting is, uh, I mean, just like the, the result I showed earlier is that, uh, I guess this is in maybe the second paper, um, that, yeah, I mean, all of those no those definitions I gave up above for Gorenstein flat cotorsion made sense for any object. Um, so certainly makes sense for sheaves. You can talk about Gorenstein flat cotorsion sheaves just fine. Um, and it turns out that these are um, precisely the Gorenstein flat sheaves which one can, I mean, you can define in a bunch of different ways and uh, um, you have to think a little bit about which is the right or if they all make sense and it kind of, they, they do work out. But uh, if I intersect those with cotorsions, that's exactly what I get. Okay, so this is, this is really actually non-trivial, I think. I mean, it needs the fact that, um, I mean, a lot of this needs the fact that an acyclic complex of cotorsion sheaves or modules or whatever you're working with has cycles that are cotorsions. It's kind of a key piece that is um, completely non-trivial, I think. Um, I mean, if there's, if there's an easier proof, I'd be interested, but uh, this is uh, sort of uh, work of Stovicek um, probably first was uh, playing around with acyclic complexes of flat cotorsion modules and uh, uh, work of um, Mm, I don't have the names off the top, but certainly uh, my co-author, Sergio Estrada, and um, I, I, some of his co-authors uh, in a little bit more generality. Okay. Um, and it turns out that, uh, so, so this is a nice category. It's, it's actually a Frobenius category, so we can look at a stable category. And so one would hope that this is sort of, I mean, in some sense, this is the naive hope that this stable category is uh, going to be the analog of the Gorenstein projective category. And it turns out that it is, um, this is a two up here, and so this is, here's one theorem, here's another theorem, that this is in fact equivalent. I mean, it's just a special case of the, the, the fact I gave earlier, um, that this is just equivalent to the totally acyclic complexes of flat uh, cotorsion sheaves on X which is in turn the same as the pure derived category. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, if, if uh, this is the right analog of the totally acyclic complexes, then this certainly should be the correct analog of the Gorenstein, uh, um, the, the stable category of Gorenstein projective modules. 
Okay. And uh, I s am I supposed to be done now or do I have a few more minutes? I can't remember. A few more minutes. You have like okay. Five. Okay, great. I have five more minutes. So um, uh, let's let's see then. So um, maybe maybe let me just state a couple more results and then I'll draw a picture to put all of this together. Um, so for instance, we can also say that uh, I mean your your scheme is Gorenstein uh, if and only if uh, I mean. This is really just an example of kind of how these kind of things work together. Um, every acyclic uh, complex of flat cotorsion, flat cotorsion um, sheaves is totally acyclic, is a totally acyclic complex. So somehow, I mean, it very much is the case that Gorenstein is related to being uh, to this particular notion of totally acyclic. And this refines the result of Murphy and Solarina also um, in terms of just total acyclicity of flats. Um, so let's see. Um, so, okay, so this sort of answers the question. I haven't been very clean about it perhaps, but um, if I scroll back here, this sort of answers what is the right thing to put here? It's the Gorenstein flat cotorsion stable category. Okay, um, so what about the singularity category? Let me let me talk about that very briefly. Um, uh, so we give a definition in in this paper that I uh, I think I said at the beginning um, uh, of uh, again a very general notion of a singularity category attached to any um, I mean. You can even do a little bit more general, but at least given a cotorsion pair in an abelian category, you have a couple associated singularity categories. And so um, let me maybe let me just write that without saying too much precise, but there um, maybe given a cotorsion pair, um, there are natural uh, associated singularity categories. Okay, so maybe by example, uh, and I mean, I'm going to be a little bit vague in on intention. I mean, these might be flat and cotorsion modules. They might be flat and cotorsion sheaves. It kind of works in either setting, but you, you end up with sort of a singularity category um, associated to an injective structure and one associated to a projective structure. So you get something that I might call D sig cot and you get another one called D sig flat. I, I am not going to try to explain where these are, but they, they are just naturally floating around. So why not do something with them? Um, and I mean, they are really singularity categories in the sense that uh, so for instance, like this one right here, uh, vanishes if and only if, um, I mean, in the case of modules, uh, if and only if uh, your R modules have finite flat dimension or you have finite weak global dimension. Um, and the second one vanishes um, if and only if every R module has a finite cotorsion dimension or your rings are like N perfect. So you can really think of them in, in a, maybe a loose sense, uh, some kind of singularity category, okay? And, um, and it, and it turned, I mean, the only reason I just say all of this just very briefly is that this is the category to look at. So um, maybe one more theorem that's in this same paper with these, these same authors up here um, is that for a semi-separated Ethereum uh, scheme, at least having finite, I mean, I also want to assume that it has finite uh, crawl dimension uh, for this result. X is Gorenstein, if and only if, this stable category of Gorenstein flat cotorsion sheaves on X is equivalent to this singularity category that uh, that I have just kind of faux defined up above. Okay, so there is some analog of this cotorsion one. Okay, so in the last sixty seconds, let me just draw one last picture and say how this all fits together. Okay, so we've got um, and uh, so so from book fights, we have the stable category of Gorenstein projectives. R modules. I'm going to write the R in here, and this is the same as K tac 
of projective R modules. And this is the same as the singularity category defined as in Buchweiz of the ring. All right. And then I've just written out some more categories. This is the stable category of Gorenstein flat retorsion modules of, uh, sorry, I'm going to put an X here. And this is the same as uh, the totally acyclic complex uh, homotopy category of flat cotorsion sheaves on X. And this is the same as the singularity category of cotorsion sheaves on X. Okay, so, so for X, uh, I guess this is the case where R is a Gorenstein ring. And this is the case where X is a Gorenstein sheaf. And in the case where uh, X is just spec of some local Gorenstein ring. The reason that this is actually a generalization, these are really the same thing. Okay, so it's not just some other string of categories. So if if this holds, if uh, x equals something like spec r. Okay, so okay, there's a lot of categories floating around, but I mean the whole justification is you can kind of take this theory from local. Gorenstein rings and transport it in the, into the setting of a, a semi-separated Ethereum scheme. And even though you don't have projectives necessarily, all works out well. So I think that's maybe a fine place to end and to see if there are questions. Well, let's use our reactions to think better. Are there any questions? Yeah, I've got a question, Petter. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the, my understanding, I, this is all a little outside the things I mostly think about, but my understanding mm -hmm. is on the, this book white singularity category and its comparison with KTAC, part of the action is um, it gives you a way to, to really understand, I mean, the, the singularity category is this quotient, and so it's hard to understand morphisms and things yes. like that. Is, yeah. Is that kind of the action here too? Is that a big part of the benefit? Is it's, it's easier to understand? I mean, this gives a concrete way to understand the singularity, singularity category on the far right. Is, yeah. is that similar motivation at play or? Yeah, I mean, at least uh, in part, yeah. I mean, okay. so, uh, I mean, one of our original motivations was this category, the, the pure drive category that was considered by uh, Murphy and Slarin. It, it, I mean, it wasn't really a homotopy category. Um, and so we realized, I mean, I guess early on that, yes, it is a homotopy category. So things are nice there. Um, and since that's really the homotopy category, I mean, the, these singular, I mean, I guess, Part of the point is there has to be some singularity category that's floating around because it, it wasn't that one, right? Um, and I, I'm not necessarily advocating that these singularity categories ought to be studied. I mean, I, I agree that the homotopy category is a much nicer thing to think about. Um, it's, it, it, it's more concrete. Um, really, I mean, this part of the picture is just saying, Yes, there is a singularity category there, um, but I, I, I would, I mean, I guess I would advocate, no, you should really work back in the homotopy category or even in this, this much nicer concrete category of modules or stable category of modules. Um, on the other hand, uh, I, I will say, I mean, you shouldn't just discount the singularity category because I mean, there's, uh, well, I don't know if, I, if I'm prepared, prepared to say anything too precise, but the vanishing of <clears throat> these, because there's two singularity categories that short, sort of show up. And it ends up being that the vanishing of both of these categories, uh, you, you can characterize all sorts of different types of rings. So I'm not really sure yet um, whether that's a good perspective to take, but you can certainly uh, in some sense, reclassify a lot of uh, types of rings in a very triangulated setting. Um, but uh, I mean, whether that's making it easier, uh, it's definitely debatable. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That's mm -hmm. helpful. That's interesting. Other questions for Petter? Maybe this is a maybe this is a naive question, but you gave us all these different characterizations of of Gorn sinus, and I was um, I was thinking about some of them. So, for example, the last one you wrote on the previous page, um, in terms of uh, all the all the yeah all the acyclic complexes of of um, 
okay so is it is it is it possible that there's some particular complex that's going to tell you whether or not you're Gorenstein? Um, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, Could you um, repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry? I mean, Just, I think you're, you're wondering whether, I mean, there's sort of a, a test complex yeah, for Gorenstein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Thank you. I mean, certainly in, in nice, settings like a local ring if uh, um, I mean if you start with the residue field and you're looking for totally acyclic complexes somehow attached to that um, but but I, I don't know I don't know the answer in, in general if there's kind of the right and and, and there was a, a maybe this is more unrelated to what you were telling us about but there was a, a theorem much earlier from oh he cited three people I think that said that um, R is Gornstein, if and only if, you know, two of these categories mm -hmm. are equivalent. And uh, well, I guess I have two, two different questions. One of them is, uh, uh, maybe this question is, is too vague, but uh, how, how different can they be when your ring is not Gornstein? I think it was, oh, uh, yeah. Is it this one right here with Berg, Jorgensen, Opperman about- uh, Yeah, that's exactly the one I meant. Yeah, so th this paper is like on Gorn, what they dub as kind of the Gornstein defect category. and. They construct a functor that goes, I mean, explicit functor from, uh, well, I guess the, the totally acyclic complex to the singularity category. And it turns out, I mean, this is a full and faithful functor and it is, um, I guess, essentially surjective or whatever term you want to use, uh, if and only if the ring is Gorenstein. So yeah, I, I agree that um, uh, it, it measuring how far you are from being you can kind of get your hands on a category that measures how Gorenstein you are I mean I have no idea if if one can say more about like you know precisely how close you are to being Gorenstein um I yeah, mean that's exactly so, what I was trying to ask so thank you yeah. yeah I mean certainly some people have thought about this but uh and, and it's an interesting question but yeah thank you other questions for Petter All right. Well, let's thank Petter again. Thank you, everybody, for you, time for other questions in the tea. Are you going to stay with us for tea, Petter? Or oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Stick around. Terrific. I just want to remind everybody that uh, we were going to be taking a break next week for Thanksgiving, but we will be back with more talks in December. <laughs>